If you turn with me in your copy of God's Word to Philippians, as I believe you all know by now, Philippians chapter 1. I'll be reading from verse 18, the latter half of 18, through verse 26. So hear God's Word. Yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, will be, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we do ask that you would fill us this morning, or that you would strengthen and empower me to proclaim your word with clarity, in truth, and in grace, or that your spirit would guide and open eyes and ears and unite hearts to fear your name and to love you. So, Lord, be at work in all of us. We need you to do that if this is to be profitable in our lives. Father, strengthen us for your glory and for our good and joy. In Christ's name, amen. It was June 8th, 1942. C.S. Lewis preached a sermon at the Church of St. Mary the Virgin in Oxford, and, and that sermon was titled, The Weight of Glory. Now, the whole message is well worth your read. You can actually find it online. But the first few paragraphs are enough, I think, to stir the heart for quite some time. So hear what Lewis wrote. If you asked 20 good men today what they thought the highest of the virtues, 19 of them would reply unselfishness. But if you asked almost any of the great Christians of old, he would have replied love. You see what has happened? A negative has, term has been substituted for a positive, and this is of more than philological importance. The negative ideal of unselfishness carries with it the suggestion, not primarily of securing good things for others, but of going without them ourselves, as if our abstinence and not their happiness was the important point. I do not think this is the Christian virtue of love. The New Testament has lots to say about self-denial, but not about self-denial as an end in itself. We are told to deny ourselves and to take up our crosses in order that we may follow Christ. And nearly every description of what we shall ultimately find if we do so contains an appeal to desire. You see what he's saying so far? He says, we deny ourselves to follow Christ and to gain all that he brings. We, we gain so much in our love and our service of others. But Lewis continued. He wrote, if there lurks in most modern minds the notion that to desire our own good and earnestly to hope for the enjoyment of it is a bad thing, I submit that the notion has crept in from Kant and the Stoics and is no part of the Christian faith. Indeed, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. See, we don't adequately understand that denying certain 
um, desires to pursue Christ will actually bring greater satisfaction and joy, that pursuing Christ is our ultimate joy and goal. We, we're, we're far too focused on the immediate and desires that are too small and too weak. Our desire for Christ is to outweigh those other desires, which are not necessarily bad in themselves, but those desires cannot be ultimate in our lives. See, we've already seen in Paul that he had a mindset, a grid through which he viewed everything in life. We've talked about his lens of grace and having an outlook filtered through the reality of a good and sovereign God. His heart was set on Christ and Christ's glory and good. He was controlled by his love for Christ, by Christ's love for him, by his being united to Christ. See, everything he did, everything he sought after, whether it actually happened that way or not in his life, because we know he did not attain to perfection in this lifetime, it was all filtered through Christ and his glory. That was the grid he longed to see through. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, the first question is very familiar. I want to read the, the larger catechism, first question, and it just adds a, a tad bit more. What is the chief and highest end of man? Man's chief and highest end is to glorify God and to fully enjoy Him forever. To fully enjoy our God. See, last week, we looked at an element of Paul's outlook on life. How he could, how he could frame the situation in which he found himself in light of Christ and the gospel. We saw that he, what he viewed as most important was not his personal comfort but the spread in advance of the gospel that Christ, that his Lord, that the one he loved dearly was proclaimed. And in that, he could rejoice no matter what he was experiencing because that goal overrode all his other concerns. He could see his suffering in light of the gospel. He could see that God was still at work. Christ was still being made known. And in that, he could rejoice. Now, this morning, we're going to continue much in that same vein. Paul's still looking at that priority of the gospel and the priority of Christ, but with a slightly different focus. Paul longed for Christ to be known, for the gospel to advance. And really, what, what we could say, in, in a sense, that drove him, what drove that desire for the gospel to advance was his desire, first and foremost, for Christ, his love for Christ. And because of that love, he desired to be a means by which his Savior and Lord would receive glory. I, I think Paul wanted nothing more than that Christ would be honored by his life or by his death. He had this, un, uh, this desire and this longing to be content with hearing the simple words of, of the Lord. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. And then these words, enter into the joy of your master. Enter into the joy. Rejoice, even now rejoice. That, and, and that leads us, I believe, beautifully into our passage where I hope that for us in looking at Paul's goal and Paul's choice, we will be stirred in our hearts to reexamine our priorities and our desires, and our lives. But I will say that that reexamination won't take hold. It will only uh, bring about change in our lives when it's driven by being enraptured by who Jesus Christ is. So let's look at the first couple of verses in our text. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. We pick up partway through verse 18 here, and what we see is Paul switches from the present to a future tense. Yes, and I will rejoice. Now, what will he rejoice in? What, what gives him this confidence in the future? It's this. He says, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. How can he say that? What, what, what does he actually mean by that phrase? Because Paul, Paul doesn't know the future. 
He doesn't know the judgment that's going to be handed down by Caesar in regard to his imprisonment, in regard to his chains. I think much of this depends on what Paul meant by the term deliverance. Now, some take this, and I think on reading through it at first glance, it, it, it comes across this way as referring to his physical chains, deliverance from imprisonment. It flows that way. It's, it's, it's the way we think of the word deliverance quite often. However, I believe here that Paul is referring to a much more significant deliverance. The Greek word that Paul used here is soteria. Uh, it, it's uh, the, the word used for salvation that Paul most commonly uses in that sense of our salvation, deliverance from the power of sin and condemnation and the wrath of God. And so when you look at it, when Paul stated that his chains, his adversity, so, you know, being in chains and maybe even the selfish preaching of some that could get under his crawl a little bit, but it, it didn't seem to because he, he loved the fact that Christ was being proclaimed, he says that would turn out for his deliverance. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense if it means a physical deliverance. Perhaps if worded differently, but, but not actually like this. And there's more to this. And Moises Silva wrote this. He said, the basis for Paul's encouragement is not merely that things will turn out all right in spite of the problems, but that the problems themselves assist us in our Christian experience. We don't think like that, do we? We, we want to get out of those issues. And what, what Paul is going through is he sees that what he's going through is actually growing him as a believer. Echoes what he wrote in Romans 5. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Suffering continues to produce in us character and hope. But even further, we see this deliverance this way because when you read verse 20 where Paul wrote that he expected this deliverance, whether by life or by death, that doesn't work if it's physically getting out of chains. And then knowing that Paul has wonderful depth of knowledge in the Hebrew Scriptures, we also see in this statement, this, this will turn out for my deliverance, that statement, that he likely pulled that directly from the book of Job. In Job 13, 15, Job says, Though he slay me, I will hope in him, yet I will argue my ways to his face. And then in verse 16, Job expressed his hope. And he said, This will be my salvation. And in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the wording is exactly the same as what Paul uses here in Philippians. This will turn out for my deliverance. Both Paul and Job are talking about salvation, about being with the Lord. So, folks, Paul, Paul knew that he was secure in his salvation. He knew that when Christ holds you in his hand, he will never let you go. We are safe and secure as believers. God would call him, would glorify him. And the, the suffering, the, the chains he experienced, and, and either the acquittal uh, or his death would be used of God, and in the end of it all, his salvation. But God would actually use means to fulfill his word to fulfill his work in Paul. Look at the clause in verse 19 that's between this will turn out for my deliverance, but for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. He writes, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. The prayers of God's people are used by God in the lives of others. Think about this. The Philippians certainly prayed for Paul to stand firm, to be consistent, to be a consistent witness, and that God would, would send the help, the provision, the, the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. It reminds me of Luke 11, verse 13, where Jesus said, If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? We ask and God gives the Spirit for our help. Paul, Paul, the, the apostle 
Paul needed the prayers of God's people so that he could stand in a way that would glorify God. Do you view your praying that way? How many of you support missionaries overseas or just this church? And do you view your prayers as that vital and important for the body of believers to stand firm and consistent in their witness for the Lord? Because according to Scripture, they are that important. And God will give the Spirit to those who ask. Because, folks, there was and there is an unseen reality. Paul knew that in his own strength, he could not stand against the spiritual forces arrayed against him. He wrote in his letter to the Ephesian church that uh, as believers, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and authorities and the spiritual farces of evil. And so what did he exhort them to do as he told them to, to put on the armor of God? In verse 18 of chapter 6, he said, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Let me say it again. Our prayers are not insignificant. If a missionary comes and asks for support and you can't financially support them and they say, will you at least pray for me? Pray for them. (laughs) Pray for them. They matter greatly. Paul trusted in, in God answering those prayers. Because we see it in verse 20, doesn't he? He says, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Because you have prayed for me and God has sent the Spirit in response to that, I, I have an eager expectation that I'll stand firm, that I will not be at all Ashamed. He was eagerly expecting. He, he had this absolutely favorable anticipation with glorious hope. This isn't, uh, he's not expressing any kind of uncertainty here or that, that, that we would consider an anxiety, but real and confident expectation that the Lord would work in his life. He did not want in any way to be ashamed. We, we've seen him write in, in Romans for, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. His shame here, he he couldn't care less what people thought of him, what they thought of Jesus, which works together, really. But he wasn't worried about uh, about public opinion, but his relationship to God and how they viewed God One commentator said his confidence lies not in his relation to his environment since the extreme alternatives of life and death could not bring such an assurance, but in God's faithfulness. Paul, as a servant of Christ Jesus, would be ashamed if his Lord was not glorified through him. Do we have that attitude? Do you ever sit and think, I'll be ashamed today if Jesus is not glorified through me. I I don't think that way often enough. That that my desire is most for His glory. I think Paul is resting here in his hope and his expectation on, on various promises in Scripture. He certainly knows the Old Testament. I think of Isaiah 28, 16, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am the one who is laid as a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. Paul quotes that in Romans twice. And it, not be in haste is, is also who, whoever believes will not be ashamed. But one of my favorite scriptures, and I, I would believe that Paul turned to this one as well, is Psalm 34. Psalm 34. 
Psalm 34. Listen to these words. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Now listen to this verse. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed, blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you as saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces shall never be ashamed. Those are precious words. Those are sweet words. And I believe words like this fueled Paul and his desire and his resolution to stand firm, to rest in the Lord, to have full courage that Christ would be honored in his body, whether by life or by death. Because that's his goal. That's what he aimed for, plain and simple. That's the outlook, the grid that Paul used, honoring Christ, bringing glory to Christ in all things. And he, he can say that in so many ways because of what we read in verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. We've all heard those words, haven't we? So just let them sink in. And for me, my, my brain works sometimes differently than others, and that's okay. Um, but there's, there's no verb in Greek. You have to supply it. And actually, for me, taking out the supplied verb helps. For to me, to live, Christ, to die, gain. To live is Christ. To die is gain. Paul is emphatic here, isn't he? Christ is his life. Christ is his all in all. For him, life consists of Christ. It's controlled by Christ. It's constrained by Christ. And though I think we're familiar with this verse, again, I, if, if I'm not diff that different, now, now I'm saying I'm not that different than the rest of you and how we think, but I don't think we think this way often enough, or very often at all. This is not the grid we think about. Our lives don't scream Christ. They scream anxiety over finances, or health, or family, or work, and so much more. For too many of us, the foundation, the center, the purpose, the, the direction, the power, and the meaning of our lives would not be described by someone else who knows us as Christ. And I think that is so challenging in our lives. And it's a good challenge. But why is it that you have to ask yourself that question. Why is it that other people probably wouldn't describe my life as being dominated by Christ? And maybe they would. And if they, if they do, glory, hallelujah. But I know too often that's not the way it looks. Just looking out over Christianity in general, looking out over Christianity on Twitter, it's definitely not what it looks like. So what got Paul to this point? Because he was just, he, he was a human just like the rest of us. Yet he was so enthralled by Christ, captured by him, he realized what was of utmost importance. And it drove everything. If, if you drew blood from, Christ, from Paul, it would bleed Christ. And I think Galatians 2.20 says so much in this. For I've been crucified with Christ. 
It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. And here's the key, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's unbelievable confidence. And it's also an understanding that without Christ loving and giving himself for him, he has no hope. But because he knows that Christ loved him and gave himself for him, the life he now lives in the flesh, he lives by faith in the Son of God. We have to know our sin and our our destiny apart from Christ to grow in our love for him. The good news is not very good news if we don't believe that the bad news ever existed. I think those last words seized Paul in his entire life. Everything in his life was for Christ, not merely some inner spirituality, but life actually lived in the day-to-day. He says, life I live in the flesh, in the body, everything. It's not my, my private, personal time with Jesus. It's all of life. And so with that, he was not afraid of death. For Paul, death was gain. And this reminds me of a sermon I read many, many years ago by Jonathan Edwards called God the Best Portion. And Edwards used the text, Psalm 73, 25, which was part of our call to worship. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Those are strong words that we read earlier. And words I desire to be more true in my life and more true in yours. And from this, Edwards drew this point. He wrote, he said, it is the spirit of a truly godly man to prefer God before all other things, either in heaven or on earth. And then he wrote, offer a saint what you will. If you deny him God, he will esteem himself miserable. God is the center of his desires, and as long as you keep his soul from its proper center, it will not be at rest. And Edwards asked questions in that sermon. He says, if you could live a life free of all pain, have all the money you wanted, everything you wanted, and didn't have God, would you take it? And he's saying the life of a truly godly person would say, no way. No way. To live is Christ. To die is gain. Now, one thing, we don't all have the same degree of desire that the psalmist had. We, we can read this and we can all, I don't want us to all leave here feeling like crud, okay? But the reality is, is we all, we're all of the same spirit. If you, if you read on in Philippians, which hopefully you have, in chapter 2, he says, Have this mind among you which is yours in Christ Jesus. As believers, we have the mind of Christ. We have the Spirit of Christ in us. What we're calling for is the direction of our life, moving towards this, moving after. We'll see it in different degrees, and that's okay. Is our direction moving forward? Because it's either going forward, we we don't stand still. We're going to regress or we're going to progress. So how do we cultivate this in our lives? What has to change? What do you need to repent of? This is not the language of a super saint, folks. It's the heart language of the believer who knows Christ. So maybe you struggle to spend any time in God's word, or any time in prayer. Seek to pursue that. Seek help in that if you need to. Because you will never grow in your love for Christ if you don't grow in your knowledge of him. Right? Didn't we just talk about that a few weeks ago? Pray that your love abounds more and more with knowledge and all discernment. 
Well, with all of this, though, with Paul, as we continue to read on, you can actually hear a conflict here, can't you? Verse 22, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose, I, can't, I cannot tell. I'm, I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. So there's a choice in some ways before Paul, not, not that he can affect the outcome, but it's what he's wrestling with in his heart and in his mind and in his soul. He, he knows that remaining, uh, even whether released or not, the, though we will see in a few verses that he's pretty confident of his release, that if he remains, it will be fruitful labor. Paul won't say after this imprisonment, you know what, that was my last time. I'm, I'm going to hang out in the med and just chill on a beach somewhere on an island. He's not moving towards retirement. He's like, if I continue on, it's fruitful labor. I'm going to continue to work for Christ and labor for him. But he's torn. That phrase, hard pressed between the two, life for Christ on earth or or gain of Christ in heaven. Thinking of more fruitful labor is so beautiful to Paul that he's actually perplexed. He, He understands what, probably more than any of us, what what that life with Christ is in heaven. But he sees the beauty of the labor for Christ and seeing people come to know Jesus and grow in their love for him as so beautiful and attractive that that this is like, I, I, I just don't know what to do. And he compares that fruit of living on with the gain of death. His desire, his desire is to depart and be with Christ. Certainly Paul often prayed, come, Lord Jesus, come. Take me home. He longed for the consummation of all things. Being with Christ is superlatively better. And it's hard for us to wrap our minds and our hearts around that to to even imagine being with God, having uninterrupted communion with him, being fully conformed to Christ seeing him, enjoying him, where there is no more pain or tears or sin or death. And yet Paul wrote, to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. And there the the more necessary is set in contrast to the far better. This more necessary actually is overriding Paul's personal desire. You see that? His personal desire, I just want to be with Jesus. But the more necessary, the the love and the self-denial and sacrifice for others is overriding that desire. The desire ends up giving way to loving and serving others. Paul's pastoral heart here is unmistakable. One commentator wrote, Paul was willing to delay crossing the finish line in his own race in order to serve the needs of the believers in Philippi. He set aside his personal ambition so that he could do what was necessary for them. Serving the community outweighs individual desires. Folks, what are we willing to delay or to deny ourselves of to serve Christ and others? So then we come to verse 25. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Now that this that he's convinced of, that's his realization that it's more necessary to stay. This isn't his definite opinion about the future, but it's his being convinced that his presence will be a blessing for the Philippian believers, that his continuing in earthly ministry is actually for the benefit of others, and that his continued ministry, uh, by that continued ministry, because of his presence with them, the Philippians will glory more and more in Christ Jesus. 
And he knew that he would serve them, and I love this phrase, for their progress and joy in the faith. I love that those two ideas are put together. Progress and joy. Folks, we cannot truly progress in the faith without joy. And we cannot have lasting joy without progress in the faith without growing in that love that abounds more and more with knowledge and all discernment. So even, even put that in your grid of wanting to know Christ more. It's progress and joy. It's not just, I'm just going to grow so I can be stronger. It's not, I want to grow in my love for the Lord so that my joy increases. Without living, well, Paul just, he calls us to so much here, doesn't he? And he shows us so much that loving and serving others for their good and joy is actually for Christ's glory and for his own good and joy. And I think that goes back to the beginning where we read from Lewis. Paul has denied himself here. Denied, at least willingly, delayed fulfillment, right? He's denied that glorious desire to be with Christ in order to serve, in order to love, to continue to follow Christ. I don't think any one of us could, could argue that Paul did not have strong desires his desire to live for Christ meant that he would give up his own personal comfort and the, 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 his, his own glorification with Christ for a time in order to serve and love others. That's proper self-denial. That's love. It's done out of love for Christ and love for others and growing in our love for Christ more and more and being able to actually say, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And to say that will enable us to live for others rather than pursuing our comfort. Because we know that in serving, in loving, we actually participate in the life of Christ. And we follow the way of our Savior, right? Our our Savior, didn't he say in Mark 10, 45, for I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Paul's following in the way of Christ in this, and we will grow in this as we grow in our love and knowledge of the Lord, of the gospel of grace, of our own sinful hearts, and and we see what God has done for us. We'll learn more and more to live in the way of Christ. And as I was studying this, I I couldn't help but think of C.T. Studd, who was dedicated in his life to to ministry and the service of the Lord. And he wrote a whole poem that had a refrain in it over and over again that many of you have heard. So I'll just finish with this, just this refrain. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Let's pray. Father, there's so much here, and I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds more, empower us to love more greatly, to love you, enrapture us with the beauty of Christ, with the glory of of knowing him. We just grow us in that. We just need to see your glory and your beauty to walk with you and to to love and to serve. Or to do this work in, in our lives, do this work in the lives of believers throughout the world who do suffer daily. Many suffer under persecution. Lord, fulfill your word in them. Send them the help of the Spirit of Christ.
that they would stand in a way where they would not at all be ashamed, but would give you glory in everything. We pray that for them and for us. In Christ's holy and precious name, amen.